it's a great privilege to be here um, and uh, present this citation. Uh, it's a very exciting uh, event. And in preparation for this evening, I, I reflected on SIBSI's uh, four core values to provide some context, really, as to um, why we're celebrating the achievement and the contribution of our honorary fellows. I would like, I'd like to start by sharing uh, a summary of those values with you. I'm sure you're all very aware of them, but just in case. Uh, the first is to provide leadership of a trusted authority on challenges facing the built environment by championing, championing the best and most innovative solutions with rigour and integrity. Second is to empower people with knowledge, training and networking so their work will have meaningful impact. Thirdly, to champion improvements in performance, safety, health and sustainability of the built environment. And finally, to inspire, encourage, welcome, support and celebrate a diverse community to join together in the creation of quality built environments. Well, I hope this citation provides an essence of Howe's attributes, activities and experiences that evidence his remarkable contribution in upholding, promoting and extending these values for the benefit of SIBSI and, importantly, for society at large. As you probably know, Howe is proud of his Welsh heritage and he set, he set off on his professional journey in Swansea where he studied chemistry and then continued in postgraduate studies, focusing his research on amorphous semiconductors for use in solar cells. This was the start of Howe's long-standing interest, interest in and engagement in the development and application of renewable technologies. However, his interests, as with any rounded building service engineer, were already interdisciplinary. This was formally recognised by the 1989 ISTRUCT Murray Buxton Award for his investigations revealing a superfluity of employing epoxy coating for construction reinforcing bars. Apparently that research alone has led to the UK likely saving billions of pounds in the intervening years. So he set his mark early. Following the successful completion of his PhD from University College Swansea, Howe continued his career by joining the building research establishment in 1986. At the time, it was a national laboratory and part of the civil service. He initially conducted research into materials and durability, whilst over the next 12 years, he continued to broaden and deepen his holistic interest and expertise in the built environment. In his final years, I'll go back to it. In his final years at BRE, um, so excuse me, I've just jumped forward a couple of pages, and I'm sure you don't want to miss this. <laughs> Let me just go back to it. That's the problem with using electronics, isn't it? I do apologise. In his final years at BRE, his focus shifted to the management of public policy on construction standards, innovation and research. This included leading the development and coordination of government policy on British, European and international standards and preparing industry guidance on the Construction product, Products Directive and CE marking legislation. The following nine years, as an independent consultant, saw how contribute to the success of a swathe of UK and Northern European construction bodies that included SIBSI, where he, his diverse skill set embraced research and reporting on construction materials, building services and renewables, and the development of construction-related standards. Howe made his initial move to SIBSI after being approached by Richard John, a former colleague and at the time SIBSI CEO. Howe joined as a research manager on a part-time basis and became a full-time technical director, director in 2007. This was seen as a strategic appointment and considered an investment in increasing the institution's knowledge offering as a key part of SIBSI's development. 
Today, Howe continues to lead the development of publications, policy work, consultations, and the dissemination of technical information, and much, much more. To quote Sibsey's previous CEO, Stephen Matthews, technical knowledge is a glue that binds the institution allow and allows it to grow. And without Howe and the technical team, this would not be possible. Howe's primary role revolves around offering technical expertise to the UK government and devolved nations on consultations and regulations. Drawing upon the vast pool of technical knowledge of 21,000 SIBSI members and the wider technical community, he actively contributes to various UK and international technical and standards committees. This active involvement has a significant impact in ensuring the delivery of safe, effective and environmentally responsible built environments. Howell has gained wide recognition for his exceptional understanding of the building regulations and their historical context, a quality that came particularly evident in his work following the tragedy of Grenfell Tower in 2017. Notably, in 2018, he spearheaded the expert group responsible for reviewing the use and structure of the approved documents, which played a crucial role in the independent review of building regulations and fire safety, led by Dame Judith Hackett. The outcomes of this effort served as a key contribution to drafting the Building Safety Act and acted as a catalyst for changes in the regulation of standards and competencies within the industry. Reflecting how significant role and contributions in the development of building safety standards, he was subsequently invited to chair the Building Regulatory Advisory Board, Regulation Advisory Board, BRAC during its final period of advising ministers. Howe's broad understanding and technical knowledge proved vital following the emergence of COVID-19 in March 2020. Initially, the challenge was to help identify a cohort of technical experts who could either be members of SAGE or be in support of their work. Howe provided expert opinion and guidance on the NHS 90 Nightingale hospitals working with incredible, incredibly short lead times to support the successful design and implementation of these much-needed facilities. This work was undertaken in close collaboration with the Royal Academy of Engineering and led to two reports to Sir Patrick Vallance, Chief Scientific Officer during the pandemic, and proved highly influential with government. He coordinated advice and guidance on emergency, sorry, emerging from lockdown four separate SIBSI guidance notes that I think we've all appreciated and now have been downloaded by over 60,000 people. These are recognised around the world. More recently, he has been engaged in work with the Department of Health and Social Care, as well as the Department of Levelling Up on response to the tragic death of two-year Awab Isak. helping to develop new guidance on, for landlords and tenants on dealing with damp and mould in homes. <clears throat> in his role as technical director and now as chief technical officer, Howe continues to have significant impact on evolving the regulatory and safety rege regime in the built environment. Sibsey reached across the world with nearly a third of the members based outside the UK how represents SIBSI on the international stage, but often includes providing technical updates on the delivery of safe and healthy built environments and to support, encourage and inform a transition towards net zero. He is instrumental in building and nurturing relationships with other engineering bodies, notably included ASHRAE and RIVA, where his knowledge and opinions are keenly appreciated and recognised by his inclusion on several high-level boards and committees. Through his unwavering dedication and countless hours of hard work, he has not only maintained, extended and shared a vast network of contact, contacts, but also enriched the influence and effectiveness of numerous SIBSI members and significantly comp contributed to the advancement of the entire profession. <clears throat> In 
December 2022, Hal received a gold award for outstanding achievement from BISA, where it was noted that Hal is at the forefront of efforts to prepare the industry for the most far-reaching building regulation reform since the Second World War. And we are all in his debt. Hal's commitment and generous approach to sharing knowledge and best practice extend beyond his professional life. He is committed congregation member of St. Helens Bishop's Gate and St. Bennet's Welsh Church within the City of London, serving as church treasurer and assisting in the maintenance of a fabric of a Grade 1 listed Wren building. In conclusion, I'm aware that this brief citation only touches on the surface of Howe's profound impact and contributions to the field of building service engineering and well beyond. His influence is truly far-reaching, enriching practices, settling higher standards, setting higher standards and deepening understanding. Howe's exceptional expertise and unwavering commitment to nurturing others' growth make him an unparalleled force in the field and a true champion of Sibsey's core values. His contributions to the field are so significant that he is clearly deserving of an honorary fellowship of a chartered institution of building service engineers. Congratulations, Hal. Thank you, thank you very much, President, Dame Judith, Sir Ken, ladies and gentlemen. Um, that was really quite embarrassing. Uh, but it is, it is a huge honour um, for me to be here this evening uh, and to receive this award of honorary fellowship of the institution. Um, I am very conscious that this is unprecedented for a staff member. Um, and I'm very grateful to those within the institution uh, who uh, proposed the award and have afforded me the opportunity to receive it. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm also very grateful. I know a number of people here this evening have made a special effort to be here, uh, and I, I'm grateful to you. And you know, Tim's gone through a number of things I've been involved in. Um, there is no I in team, is the cliché. Um, and I'd like to thank many of you who've been part of various teams, some of the people who worked on the COVID guidance, some of you who worked on SIBSI responses to Grenfell, some of you who've worked on many of the other things over the last quarter of a century. Thank you all um, for your part in that. Um, I'm also very mindful that there is a proverb that says it is not glorious to seek one's own glory. There is some wisdom in the book of Proverbs. Um, if I may say a few words, I'm going to look back and then I want to look forward a bit because I think we do need to look forward uh, in our industry. Um, when our children were younger, the, the oldest was a great fan of Arthur Ransom. Um, and there's an Arthur Ransom book called We Didn't Mean to Go to Sea. Uh, there's an irony here because he's ended up as a marine engineer in the Royal Fleet Auxiliary. Um, and for me, um, I didn't really mean to join the civil service, and I wasn't particularly looking to get into the construction sector. Um, but um, I'd, I'd spent, I, I'd, I'd had a, an interest in engineering um, for, throughout my, my childhood and, and teens, uh, and I think my parents were dragged around at least two holidays in North America where the itinerary was partly determined by major 
civil engineering and infrastructure projects, whether it was suspension bridges or some of the really big dams that Roosevelt built under the New Deal. Um, the Grand Coulee Dam is a particularly good example where they did some really innovative things with concrete. Um, and I, I must have had an early interest in it. So um, when, when I joined the BRE, interestingly, I found myself in the section that dealt with concrete durability. Uh, and we were just in the middle of dealing with the last major um, crisis brought about by homes that didn't perform. Um, that was the precastrian forced concrete homes problem in the 1980s where um, the government had, and I genuinely believe, because the science hadn't emerged at this point, they'd sold a load of council houses that two, three, four years down the line turned out to have serious reinforcement corrosion problems. And bluntly, well, they hadn't been missold because nobody knew it, but it was serious and it led to the Housing Defects Act and possibly one or two lessons that we've picked up in recent years, although whether we've picked them up enough, I'm not sure. Um, so I spent time doing that, um, and then I got moved into standards making. Um, initially, because we needed a UK rep on the standards committee in the early days of SEN, um, and I got packed off uh, at a relatively early age, and I learnt then the construction industry um, didn't, didn't take well um, to younger people turning up and trying to make a contribution in meetings. Um, and it wasn't just the British bit of it, the Germans took to it even worse, with apologies to any German colleagues. Uh, but that's what I did, and I clearly didn't make a complete hash of it, um, because I then found myself given the job of coordinating all the standards work for what was then the Department of Environment. Um, we were trying to implement the Construction Products Directive, and CE marking. Um, so I was involved in that 30 years ago, and it's worth reflecting, because it's relevant to today and the look forward, CE marking was brought in to facilitate free movement of goods and services. It was never a safety mark, was it, Peter? Um, and then I got moved into another job at the BRE. Privatisation was looming, and um, the government and industry set up something called the Construction Research and Innovation Strategy Panel, or CRISP, which some people may recall. Originally, it was going to be the Construction Research Assessment Panel, but somebody worked out five minutes before they went to see the minister that the acronym wasn't quite appropriate. So CRISP was cooked up. Um, and because it involved advising on the privatisation of BRE, um, I found myself knowing a bit more than the new management liked, and it made sense to move on and do something else. And as Tim said, Richard John um, asked me to go to Ballum, um, initially for three years. So I've either outstayed my welcome or found a little more to do. Um, Doing a PhD teaches you to read and learn fast, so uh, going to Sibsey um, meant that I had to do that. Um, Tim's already mentioned that my PhD, um, making solar cells, this was 40 years ago when they really were quite novel, um, taught me a lot about energy. Um, it also taught me a lot about fire safety, believe it or not. Um, to make the amorphous silicon um, involved um, putting a gas called silane it's the silicon analogue of methane, silicon with four hydrogens hanging off it. Methane, you just have to be careful having a match around it because it might go bang. Silane is spontaneously combustible on contact with air. I'm not convinced I'd have been allowed to do that PhD if I started now because I don't think we'd get the risk assessment through. Um, but it taught me a lot, and when it did go bang, um, it went bang quite spectacularly. Um, as I learned one, for one, one evening, and discovered that several of the lecturers hadn't got a clue what to do with the fire extinguisher. <laughs> so that was my early exposure to fire safety. Um, and um, so when I joined, and curiously, the first project I had at the BRE, was, uh, sorry, at SIBSI, we'd, we'd got a contract to develop some guidance on photovoltaics. And 
we'd got quite a large steering group gathered and they were all in one of the big meeting rooms in Balham and everybody went round the table explaining who they were and I was the new kid on the block and I'm not sure what people made of me. So I introduced myself last and explained I'd just joined SIBSI. I'd been at the BRE for a few years, but before that I'd done a PhD making amorphous zircon for photovoltaics. And the room suddenly went quiet and they thought, oh, he might actually know something about this. Um, and we got the guidance out, and it was the first of many. Um, the other thing that it dragged me into was working with government, um, initially on the 2002 version of Part L, for those who remember it. And um, we were also heavily involved in the development of the, um, of the European uh, Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. Now, for people who get frustrated that six years after Grenfell we don't appear to have done a lot, um, it took us six years to implement the EPBD. And that was a single directive of about 30 articles spread over maybe 10 or 12 pages. And as you all know, the Building Safety Act is at least twice that length. Um, so it does put some of what we're trying to do now into perspective. Uh, and, and the scale of the challenge uh, that we currently uh, face. One of the other interesting conversations at that time, um, we were trying to uh, persuade the department that chartered engineers ought to be allowed to sign off that the work they'd done complied with building regs. And we met some considerable resistance within the department um, because they said, well, the problem is you people only know about Part L. Um, and, uh, you know, we need to be sure that whatever's done under Part L um, also complies with Part B. Well, there's a fateful irony in that, isn't there? And now here we are 20 years on, and due to the Building Safety Act and the reforms that have followed Dame Judith's report, we're now going to ask everybody to sign off that what they've done is actually compliant with the building regs. Not just one bit of it, but the whole jolly lot. And if they can't sign it off, there are going to be some interesting conversations coming up, I think. The, looking forward, the institution and its members have got a vital role to play in delivering change. Um, and not just in building safety, uh, you know, there's a lot of debate about net zero at the moment, um, and whilst I accept that there might need to be debate about um, how we go about it and, and the pace at which we can do things and the capacity we've got to do it, um, I, I do hope that we're all agreed that you know, the chemistry is simple. If you put more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, it will retain more heat and the planet will warm up. That's simple chemistry. Um, what it does to the planet is more complicated and how we deal with it is more complicated. But we've simply got no choice. So we have to deal with fundamental change on two fronts. Our buildings need to be safe. The people who live in high-rise residential buildings when they go to bed tonight, they've got as much right to feel safe as any of us have when we go home. And maybe some of you live in higher risk buildings already. And, and I genuinely believe we cannot call housing in Britain modern until we are sure that it's safe. And I think we've still got work to do on that front. But whilst our buildings need to be safe, they also need to be sustainable. They need to be low carbon both in use and in their construction. So operational and embodied carbon or whole life carbon is really important. And when we add that to the safety agenda, we've really got a major job on our hands. Um, I hope I can be allowed a, a personal reflection. Um, Tim mentioned my um, involvement in, in two church families in, in London. Um, and as a Christian, I'm thankful to God for the chance he's given me to serve society as well as the institution um, in the built environment. Um, and I'm conscious I'm nearer the end of my working life than the beginning by quite a way. Um, I'm very clear that the built environment still offers huge challenges and opportunities to the next generation and the one after. Science and engineering will be absolutely central 
to realising the opportunities and overcoming the challenges. We've got a huge amount to do to make our housing stock safe and healthy, um, and you know, that means addressing the fire problems, the indoor quality problems uh, that, uh, that Tim alluded to. Uh, you know, the idea that a two-year-old dies in their home because it was damp and mouldy should shock every one of us um, to want to do something about it and not rest until something is done. I'm glad to say that the early evidence is that the government is responding much more urgently to the coroner's report into Awa Bishak's death than to certain earlier incidents in London involving fires. Just to finish off, a few words of thanks, if I may. Um, I wouldn't be here this evening but for some absent friends. Um, it is hard to single people out, but I do want to pay tribute to um, two men who are no longer with us, the late Brian Moss and the late Graham Manley, because without Brian and Graham, um, Stephen Matthews would never have been able to bring me to Sibsey on a full-time basis. Um, so I do want to, to acknowledge them. Uh, and maybe we wouldn't have the technical department we've got. Um, I also wouldn't be here without the support of my family, uh, in particular my wife, um, who is often doing things at home to enable me to be doing things with Sibsey. Um, and she's again doing that this evening, as on uh, countless other occasions. And finally, I just want to say thank you to the institution and to every one of you here this evening for the opportunity to work with you over the years. Um, and you know, I'm convinced that Sibsey has still got a key role to play in both the modernisation and the decarbonisation of the built environment in this country and beyond. Thank you very much. <laughs>